It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. There's an old saying that goes, the essence of tyranny is the denial of complexity. Sometimes scholars bring clarity by making things less clear. This is true in most academic pursuits, but it matters especially in biblical scholarship, which deals with the sacred texts of religious traditions. In the last Maxwell Institute podcast episode, Peter Martins joined us to talk about how early Christians studied the Bible. This episode features a recording of Peter Martin's delivering his paper on the Bible and early Christianity. The paper was delivered at Brigham Young University in March of 2015. You can read a polished version of it in the Maxwell Institute's journal Studies in the Bible and Antiquity, Volume 7. You can check that out at bit.ly slash sbav7. Now here's Carl Griffin of the Maxwell Institute introducing Dr. Peter Martin's. really pleased today to have uh, Professor Peter Martins with us here from St. Louis University. Um, I was interested uh, to know that Peter actually started in biology um, before he decided to um, go into a far less lucrative field and and go into theology, but uh, started as as an undergraduate in biology biology at Baylor, uh, took a THM in historical theology at Dallas Theological Seminary, and then took his PhD the University of Notre Dame in theology, and he is an assistant professor of theological studies at St. Louis University. Um, he's had a number of, uh, of fellowships, uh, has been a visiting professor at uh, both Notre Dame and Yale Divinity School, where he tells me he taught uh, the two the first two LDS students who, who enrolled in Yale Div, and uh, uh, taught, ha- had them in a class on origin, which uh, where, of course, he discussed um, pre-existence of souls and other things that are of interest to LDS people. Um, his first monograph was on origin and scripture, the contours of the exegetical life. He'll be speaking with us to, to us today on the early Christian interpretation of the Bible. Um, he's uh, hard at work right now finishing uh, his second Oxford volume uh, on Adrian's introduction to the divine scriptures, uh, uh, a, and at one, of, one of the earliest handbooks to, uh, to the Bible uh, written and something that hasn't been much studied. Um, With that, we'll turn the mic over to him and welcome Professor Peter Martins. Thank you for that introduction and for the invitation to be here. This is my first time at Brigham Young University, my first time in Utah. I've only been here for 24 hours, but it's been very enjoyable. Uh, I envy the natural landscape. Can you hear me at the back? All right, great. One of the most exciting, though by no means uncontroversial, academic developments in the past hundred years has been the renaissance of interest in how the Bible was interpreted by early Christians. If we are to adequately characterize this renaissance, it is crucial to acknowledge that it has often been motivated by more than an antiquarian interest in reconstructing a dusty corner of late antique Christianity. On nearly any view of the long history of scriptural interpretation, it is readily acknowledged that this discipline underwent a profound transformation in the modern era. Precisely when, how, and why this revolution took place is debated. But no one contests that it happened, and that its two main protagonists, the pre-modern and modern iterations of this discipline, often stand in a disjunctive and even hostile relationship to one another. In his Bampton lectures delivered at the University of Oxford in 1885, Frederick Farrar gave classic expression to the modern and withering critique of pre-modern exegesis. Farrar presented a view of early Christian biblical interpreters that is still representative of how many biblical scholars today, over 125 years later, view these figures. The task before us, Farrar wrote, is in some respects a melancholy one. We shall pass in swift review many centuries of exegesis and shall be compelled to see that they were in the main centuries during which the interpretation of scripture has been dominated by unproven theories and overladen by untenable results. 
Exegesis has often darkened the true meaning of scripture, not evolved or elucidated it. And this is no mere assertion. If we test its truth by the Darwinian principle of the survival of the fittest, we shall see that as a matter of fact. The vast mass of what has passed for scriptural interpretation is no longer deemed tenable and has now been condemned and rejected by the wider knowledge and deeper insight of mankind. Farrar continues, calling to mind recent developments in archaeology, history, and comparative religion, and concludes that these, that these disciplines have resulted in the indefinite limitation, if not the complete abandonment, of the principles which prevailed for many hundreds of years in the exegesis of scripture and in the consignment to oblivion for every purpose except that of curiosity, of the special meanings assigned by these methods to book after book and verse after verse of the sacred writings. For Farrar, the history of interpretation was, quote, to a large extent, a history of errors, unquote. And it was Origen, a figure we will spend a bit of time with this morning, who helped establish these errors for more than a thousand years. While there are very important exceptions to this dismissive attitude today, I suspect that Farrar's sentiments will probably still ring true to many professional biblical scholars, for whom patristic biblical interpretation is at best a distraction and at worst an obstacle to sound biblical exegesis. There have been a number of disciplinary, ecclesiastical, and institutional factors that have contributed to the renewal of interest in patristic exegesis. I will suggest a few to you this morning. But it is important to appreciate that this renaissance has transpired against the backdrop of a long and deep suspicion about the value of pre-modern exegesis in Christian circles. This becomes especially clear when we turn to the early historical studies in the field. They were authored by Christian intellectuals who were not only familiar with this suspicion, but whose studies were also marked by it, either reiterating its veracity or calling it into question. I offer two brief and contrasting examples as they pertain to Origen, the towering third century scholar of the Bible and lightning rod for many subsequent debates about biblical exegesis. In his book, History and Spirit, Henri de Lubac, a Jesuit priest, threw into sharp relief the competing perspectives from which Origen's exegesis had often been approached. On the one hand, there were the readers, most readers in fact, who saw nothing of interest in Origen. They rejected his approach to scripture as an aberration and did not, that did not even deserve from the historian a glance of sympathetic curiosity and effort to rediscover its soul. The voice of Farrar is unmistakable. On the other hand, de Lubac warned, it would be no less an error to admire these ancient constructions so much that we wish to take up permanent residence in them. Resisting unqualified rejection as well as naive retrieval, de Lubac's project lay somewhere between these two extremes. It aimed for a disposition that was apparently quite rare in his day, an appreciative analysis that steered clear of the debilitating prejudice that saw from the start nothing of value in origin, as well as the avoidance of an excessive enthusiasm that would lead us to imitate the ancients' methods. De Lubac ultimately concluded that Origen's exegetical project was of mixed value. Beneath its discardable husk lay an enduring kernel. At the heart of the father's exegesis dwells a sacred element that belongs to the treasure of the Catholic faith." Unquote. R.P.C. Hansen, later Bishop of Cloger, published Allegory and Event, nine years after de Lubac's History and Spirit. Hansen's book raised the alarm about the increasingly sympathetic ways in which the French Jesuits were approaching Origen's biblical scholarship. Hansen overtly aligned himself with contemporary historical critical biblical exegesis. On the opening page of his study, he raised the question that would shape his entire inquiry. Has the interpretation of the Bible as it is practiced today anything seriously in common with the interpretation of the Bible as origin and indeed as the early church generally practiced it? 
as becomes increasingly clear to the reader of Hansen's book, the answer to this question is, with very few exceptions, no. Origen's biblical exegesis was vastly inferior to contemporary biblical scholarship, whose guiding principle was the question of what any given text meant when it was first written or uttered to the first audience for which it was intended. It is helpful to have these two studies in mind by de Lubach and Hansen. They are two of the most important and influential books on Origen's exegesis and astonishingly both still remain in print over half a century later, an indication of their significance for the continuing interest in Origen. These books also demonstrate how research into early Christian biblical exegesis has rarely been motivated by simple antiquarian interests. De Lubach and Hansen were genuinely interested in helping their readers understand Origen's exegesis, but this did not preclude contemporary debates about biblical scholarship from seeping into the pages of their writings. Even if we seldom encounter research on Origen or any other early Christian figures today that is characterized by such undisguised normative inquiries, whether in the form of Hansen's brazen call to reject or de Lubach's plea to retrieve a vital essence, the topics that scholars have chosen, the ways in which they have handled them, and indeed even the topics that have been ignored, have often reflected the evolving debates within contemporary biblical scholarship, and indeed debates outside this discipline. Before turning to some of the trends in the research, it might be useful to briefly sketch a narrative of the rise of interest in early Christian biblical interpretation, or the reception history of the Bible, as it is sometimes called. A good point to begin this narrative is in the years following World War II, where interest in this topic experienced a pronounced revival. Among continental European Catholics, a growing dissatisfaction arose with the strongly Thomistic and rationalistic orientation of their theological program, a program often devoid of a clear connection to scripture. New sources for thinking the faith were thought, and so these resourcement theologians turned east. An important vehicle for this new orientation within Catholic theology was the series Source Chrétienne, founded in Lyon, France, by the Jesuits Jean Danielou, Claude Mondesser, and Henri de Lubac. This series aimed to expand the canon of texts for doing Catholic theology. Its first volume was saturated with significance. The aforementioned Jean Danielou, one of the leading resourcement theologians, published an edition of Gregory of Nyssa's Life of Moses. Here readers were presented with a patristic text, not a medieval one, a Greek text, and not a Latin one. One made accessible to the reading public with a facing French translation, not simply an edition accessible only to the classically trained scholar a text focused on the spiritual or mystical life and not on the subtle distinctions of fourth century Trinitarian theology, and a text that integrated scriptural exegesis into its theological program, not one in which the Bible retreated into the background. In Gregory's Life of Moses, readers entered into the rich world of early Christian allegory, in which Gregory invited his audience to join Moses in the ascent up Mount Sinai, an allegory of the Christian's never ceasing ascent to the eschatological face-to-face -face encounter with God. Today, Source Chrétienne remains an important vehicle for transmitting patristic biblical interpretation, but it has been joined by a number of other series that merit attention. Patristic commentaries and sermons on scripture are continually being edited within the major series of critical editions, such as the Corpus Christianorum series or Oxford's early Christian texts, where my own edition of Adrian is going to be forthcoming. Perhaps the most notable development in coming years will be the new editions and studies of Alexandrian and Antiochian biblical exegesis coming out of Berlin. Much of this foundational textual work has been translated into an array of modern European languages. English speakers have been generally well served, and there is even an anthology of early Christian biblical interpretation that remains serviceable. <laughs> 
I should note, however, that many really important early Christian treatises on the Bible, as well as homilies and commentaries on it, remain unedited, or if edited, have never been translated into English. There is much textual work that remains to be done. As this work has progressed, specialized articles and books have naturally followed. There is a journal in Italy devoted to the history of exegesis, and Brill has a monograph series called The Bible in Ancient Christianity. A very important research tool has also been developed that's currently morphing from its original print format to a digital format, Biblia Patristica. This reference work allows readers to identify the places in writings where early Christian authors discussed a particular verse a very handy reference work. And not a few overviews of the field have been authored. Francis Young's Biblical Exegesis and the Formation of Christian Culture I regard as the most important of these. The work is becoming dated, but still remains the point of departure for any serious research in the field. I will revisit this book later in my talk. As we follow the life cycle of this emerging field of study, we arrive finally at the reference works. Charles Conningieser's Handbook of Patristic Exegesis receives the notable distinction of becoming the first reference work devoted exclusively to biblical interpretation in early Christianity. It was published in 2004. The Oxford Handbook of Early Christian Biblical Interpretation is currently under the editorial supervision of Paul Blowers and myself. There are several indications that work in this field is still crescendoing today. Perhaps the most compelling evidence for the establishment of the study of patristic exegesis as a scholarly discipline at the beginning of the 21st century is that this topic is surfacing beyond the traditional boundaries of early Christian studies. Arguably the most important development has been the editorial decision at Walter de Gruyter to integrate the reception history of the Bible, patristic exegesis included, into its encyclopedia of the Bible and its reception. In their introduction, the editors of the EBR remark that interest in the reception history of the Bible has many roots, so that now a well-established branch of biblical studies, the history of exegesis, continues to contribute to the debate about the meanings of the biblical text. The willingness of this encyclopedia to consider not simply the current state of scholarship on the Bible, but also the Bible's reception in the patristic period reflects emerging scholarly agendas and undoubtedly will also set them. On this issue of reception history, the contrast between the EBR, which will be the major reference work on the Bible for coming decades, and its predecessor, the Anchor Bible Dictionary, is striking. The latter rarely attended to the topic, and its allergy to anything pre-modern is suggested by the absence of an entry on allegory even though the Apostle Paul used the word in his letter to the Galatians. I hope to have conveyed through this very schematic orientation to research on early Christian biblical interpretation that what began as a narrow topic of academic interest around the middle of the 20th century has gradually blossomed into a full-fledged international field of study, perhaps even a discipline in its own right. It has its editions and translations, its research tools, monograph series, a journal, and several reference works. As I see it, it is a field of study animated by three major stakeholders who approach it with often disparate motivations. First, you have the professional biblical scholars who, perhaps due to a growing exhaustion with, or simply the exhaustion of traditional approaches to scripture, find in reception history new avenues that supplement how they have examined canonical texts. <clears throat> Second, you have historians of Christianity who increasingly recognize the importance of scripture and the scribal, interpretive, and institutional cultures, institutional cultures that emerged around it for reconstructing the world of early Christians. And then you have scholars and preachers with normative theological programs who, not unlike the Rezor Small theologians of the mid-20th century in Europe, wish to integrate scripture more obviously into their own projects. In patristic exegesis, they tend to find such an ally. So I belong 
to the second of these stakeholders. I'm an historian of early Christianity, and while interested in how the other two stakeholders view my work, my research remains firmly tied to the field once called patristics, now called early Christian studies. Most of my work has been on Origen, the famous third century Christian. Origen was many things, an educator, a priest, an apologist, a diplomat, a churchman, a heretic, among others. And subsequent generations, ours included, have struggled to offer a coherent portrait of this complex figure. Yet among friends and foes alike, few have lost sight of Origen, the biblical scholar. With only a touch of exaggeration, Adolf von Harnack, the great Protestant historian of theology, quipped, there has never been a theologian in the church who desired to be, and indeed was, so exclusively an interpreter of the Bible as Origen was. It is hardly surprising then that this larger renaissance of interest in patristic exegesis that I have briefly sketched out for you has often focused specifically on Origen. He was extraordinarily prolific. His exegetical writings exercised influence and stirred much controversy among subsequent Christians in the Greek, Latin, and Syriac speaking worlds. It is my contention that if we attend to the trends in the research on Origen, we will have a good sense as to the larger trends that run through the research on patristic scriptural exegesis more generally. I'm not going to capture all the scholarship. I don't want to try to, and many might disagree with what I say here, but what I want to do is provide a perspective on two prominent trends. The first is a focus on Origen's literary scholarship by which I mean his philological procedures, including his quest for the literal and allegorical reference of scripture. The second that I want to look at is the growing interest in the social dynamics of Origen's biblical scholarship. So let's begin with the first, Origen's literary scholarship. In the preface to his history of classical scholarship, Rudolf Pfeiffer announced his quest to identify a philologia perennis, that is to say, a literary scholarship that was still enduring while omitting what was obsolete and past forever. Pfeiffer did not explicitly identify this chaff, though he tipped his hand when he referred later in his preface to the Alexandrian scholar poets as our ancestors and underscored that they did not practice allegorical interpretation. Allegorical interpretation played a very small role in Pfeiffer's narrative, and he was not alone among scholars of his generation in relegating it to the margins. Allegory was not scholarship, or at least not philologia perennis. There is a striking parallel to Pfeiffer's approach in the Origenian scholarship. A Swiss scholar, Bernhard Neuschäfer, wrote a book called Origenes als Philologe, Origen the Philologist. In this book, he examines four main interpretive exercises of the typical late antique classroom and how they all surface in Origen's work. Text criticism, reading a passage out loud, literary and historical analysis, and finally, aesthetic and moral evaluation. Neuschafer's book is one of the towering achievements in 20th century Originian scholarship. It's not without precedent, but it remains the main work. Neuschafer raises a question on the closing pages of his study that strongly echoes Pfeiffer's earlier research. Given the long-standing interest in Origen the allegorist and now Neuschafer's own account of Origen the philologist, do we have here two irreconcilable portraits? Or is it possible that these two halves can be woven together into a single harmonious picture? Neuschafer leaves the question unanswered though I suspect he would favor the latter scenario. Even so, the talk of two halves and the deliberate exclusion of allegory from the discussion of Origen's philology suggests that an enduring modern prejudice is still at work. Even if we can link allegory to philology, allegory is not philology. On the whole, my impression is that over the course of the last half century, 
classicists and historians of literary criticism have increasingly resisted this tendency to divorce allegory from philology or literary analysis. Robert Lamberton, George Boy Stones, and Peter Strzok, to name only a few, have often been more inclined than their counterparts in church history to treat allegory as integral and not peripheral to late antique literary scholarship. And this takes us to origin the allegorist. There has seemingly never been a period in the modern epoch when scholars have not been interested in, or perhaps we should say fixated on, Origin's allegory. Nor is this surprising, since it is precisely here where he stands at his farthest remove from modern biblical scholarship. As I noted above, it was precisely through this lens that RPC Hansen evaluated Origen's project. For Hansen, Origen's biblical interpretation exemplified his language, the alchemy of allegory, and was deficient in comparison to contemporary biblical scholarship, whose guiding principle is the question of what any given text meant when it was first written or uttered to the first audience for which it was intended. Unlike the great expositors of the past, who successfully put themselves into the minds of the biblical author whom they are interpreting, Hansen writes, Origen on countless occasions gives the opposite impression, that, is re that he is reading into the mind of the biblical author thoughts which are really his own. The critical subject, Hansen continues, upon which Origen never accepted the biblical viewpoint was the significance of history. To the writers of the Bible, history is the place where God reveals himself. The Jewish historians may not have achieved the accuracy of a modern historian, but they did believe that in the events of history, God's will and purposes were made plain. While Hansen is clear that Origen did not reject history, as some scholars insist, he did not have a deep respect for it. History, Hansen summarizes, is therefore an essential ingredient of revelation. It is an, an inseparable part of the manner in which God reveals himself. One might almost say that in the incarnation, God has taken history into himself. To this insight, Origen is blind. Hansen's argument then is that there are two different views of history. History as event and history as parable. In history as event, in history as the field of God's self-revelation, Origen is apparently not interested. He is only interested in history as parable or symbol of truths about God. Herein lies the force of Hansen's book title, Allegory and Event. The and means something like is opposed to or trivializes. This book was intended as a rebuttal to the growing sympathies with origins biblical scholarship among the Razors Mont French Jesuits, especially Henri de Lubac. De Lubac, as noted earlier, sought to rehabilitate the tarnished legacy of Origen, particularly the charge that he was a reckless allegorist mired in pagan exegesis. The scholarship of de Lubac and Hansen was reflected, reflective of one of the most persistent historiographical distinctions of the modern era. They largely accepted the reigning demarcation of the Hellenistic pagan from the salutary Hebrew Christian. Hellenistic pagan, Hebrew Christian. For Hansen, Origen missed the Hebraic view of history's significance because he was uncritically Hellenistic. For de Lubac, Origen's allegory or spiritual exegesis was not pagan, but primarily indebted to the traditions of exegesis already seen in the New Testament, particularly Paul's. But for de Lubac, there was more than an external link between Origen and the New Testament. There was also a Catholic instinct that drove Origen's project, which itself could not be disentangled from a whole manner of thinking, a whole worldview, a whole interpretation of Christianity. De Lubac's book was ultimately about the relationship between the Old and New Testaments. When Origen allegorized the Old, he sought to discern Jesus Christ, the Church, or indeed the New Testament, in the figures, events, and institutions narrated in Israel's scriptures. The and in the title History and Spirit did not mark conflict or the hostile rejection of the old history in favor of the new spirit, but a complex, unique, and ultimately mysterious harmony. <laughs>
The New Testament is hidden in the old, the Lubach writes, and the old is made clear in the new. This harmony ultimately expressed a Christological thesis with which de Lubach closed his studies. By bringing himself, Christ brought renewal. Today, most of us are aware that the Hellenistic Hebraic dichotomy is far too simplistic and that Origen's exegetical project cannot be situated as neatly in one camp or the other as both Hansen and de Lubach thought. Yet despite the differing agendas of both authors, my impression is that there's a good deal less debate between them than first meets the eye. Both de Lubach and Hansen knew that Origen's view of scripture and the way he read it differed markedly from contemporary biblical scholarship. But both remained strongly perspectival in their approach. One viewed this difference sympathetically and the other critically. Neither author was particularly interested in discovering the full range of presuppositions that informed these disparate approaches to scripture, and so the robust evaluation of both Origen's approach and the modern approach to the Bible was decidedly underdeveloped. The reader has the distinct impression that these books belonged more to the world of campaigns than arguments. Now to my second trend. The most striking shift in the scholarship in the last half century has been a new social contextualization of origin scriptural exegesis. In this trajectory, representative of the larger shift in patristic studies in the North American scene, the driving questions have been reoriented. No longer, how did Origen interpret or view the Bible, but rather, how did his exegetical project influence society? Emblematic of this shift for the whole field is the title of Francis Young's landmark work, to which I referred earlier. It's called Biblical Exegesis and the Formation of Christian Culture. What makes this development so striking is that it has created unexpected bedfellows. On the one hand, scholars who work within an ecclesiastical and theological framework see the new focus as an exploration of Origen's larger pastoral, spiritual, or pedagogical vision. On the other hand, scholars who dialogue with contemporary literary and cultural studies have seen this inquiry furthering the larger theoretical concern for identifying the ways in which our cultures are in fact fluid and constructed, not simply static or given realities. This new focus on the cultural impact of Origen's biblical scholarship surfaces strongly in Karen Jo Torgensen's hermeneutical procedure and method in Origen's exegesis. She insists that we organize Origen's exegesis around the figure of the hearer or reader. Torgensen argues for a twofold pedagogy of the Logos. The original historical teaching, which was located in the literal sense of scripture, and the contemporary pedagogy which resided in the spiritual sense and was continually being directed toward new audiences. Origen's allegorical project, Torgensen contends, was to reenact the original pedagogical activity of the Logos for a contemporary audience. Therefore, she writes, Origen's exegesis moves from the saving doctrines of Christ once taught to the saints to the same saving doctrines once taught to hearers today. I got some competition here. I'm doing my best. Don't worry about it. Apologies to Karen to Torgensen for interrupting a summary of her work. <laughs> Let me draw my talk to a close of a few pages here. Begging your indulgence as I map out some of my own work and interests in the field. When I set out to write my book on Origen, my impression was that most of the research had been directed towards specific facets of Origen's exegetical project, but that the overall shape of this project had not been adequately sketched. It was also my impression that despite the bewildering array of studies on Origen's biblical scholarship, there was also a glaring omission in the literature, a failure to account for the sort of person doing scriptural exegesis. What had gone missing, in my view, was a biographical approach to Origen's biblical interpretation. Origen's writings teem with reflections about the sort of credentials that are required to be a good reader of the Bible. 
So in my book, to which Carl referred in the introduction, um, I adopt this biographical approach by examining Origen's portrait of the ideal scriptural interpreter. For Origen, ideal interpreters were far more than philologists steeped in the skills and teachings conveyed by Greco-Roman education. Their profile also included a commitment to Christianity from which they gathered a spectrum of loyalties, guidelines, dispositions, relationships, and doctrines that tangibly shaped how they practiced and thought about their biblical scholarship. And so not unlike the emerging consensus among historians of late antique philosophy, I argue that for origin, scriptural exegesis was a way of life and a particular sort of life. Origen contextualized interpreters within the drama of Christian salvation. They did not simply examine this drama as it unfolded on scripture's pages. In doing biblical interpretation well, they also thought themselves to be participating in this drama by expressing various facets of their existing Christian commitment. So for example, by following Paul's exegetical precedent, by reading in conformity with the church's rule of faith, and exercising a wide range of reading virtues while examining scripture. Ideal interpreters, qua interpreters, sought to embark upon a way of salvation that ultimately culminated in the contemplation of God. In my estimation, one of the great advantages of introducing a biographical approach to the study of patristic biblical exegesis is that it helps us see more than a particular facet of ancient scriptural scholarship. The interpreter was the animating center of the entire project of biblical interpretation. And so to offer a detailed biographical portrait of this person is to hold out the promise of disclosing the sweeping contours of the entire Origenian project, and I think of finding new ways to compare and contrast it with the projects of his later critics, like Theodore of Mopsuestia. As some of you might know, this became the exegetical debate in early Christianity, and it remains to this day very poorly understood. This is precisely the area where I hope to direct my attention in coming years. The exegetical projects, or perhaps better, exegetical cultures of Alexandria and Antioch. The complex relationship between these cultures cannot be collapsed into who allegorized and who read literally. These cultures were replete with assumptions, indeed convictions about ideal readers, pagan models for interpretation, notions of textuality, of institutional contexts, of facets or stages of exegesis, metaphors for reading, all of which informed the emergence of two different and sometimes competing approaches to authoritative Christian texts. Concluding, in the opening pages of Frances Young's Biblical Exegesis in the Formation of Christian Culture, she remarks that her two aims are to challenge accepted generalizations in the standard accounts and to work with certain key texts and authors to provide living examples of the exegetical process. These are still excellent guidelines for working in the field, but I would like to add one more. I often find myself returning to the realization that work on Origen's biblical scholarship and the biblical scholarship of other early Christian figures is easily susceptible to unintentional anachronism. For many of us, our first exposure to biblical scholarship was not what we found in Origen, but what we experienced in the classrooms where we were initiated into the guild of contemporary biblical scholarship. Words like scripture, exegesis, and scholarship flow easily off our tongues. Their denotations and connotations configured by the academic lexicon of the 21st century. Yet we use these very same words to understand early Christian scriptural exegesis and translate its writings. Indeed, some of these words are transliterations of the original Greek and Latin terms we study. But the registers of these ancient words rarely overlap tidily with their modern equivalents. This is a challenge in all historical work, 
but especially one that confronts us historians of biblical interpretation. For this discipline unwent, underwent an enduring revolution in the modern era. And we don't stand on Origen's side of that revolution, but on this side, where with the passing of time, the old ways become increasingly foreign. This is perhaps the greatest demand placed on the historian of biblical exegesis, to be vigilantly self-aware of the limitations of our language and correspondingly responsive to the strangeness of the ancient world that awaits us. Thank you for your patience and your concentration. Are we fielding questions? Uh, do you, would you like to do that? Yes. We have a few minutes. Um, I'll just go ahead. Everybody can just start to the theater. Go ahead. Yeah, I enjoyed that. You sketched out the history and a bit of uh, the reception of the Bible late antiquity. And talk about some of the factors that contribute to this kind of growing interest over well the last half century. There's one factor I thought you might have mentioned here, but I never heard it. I'm just wondering if you have a comment on this. Um, what about the rise of textual criticism in this? Because it seems that textual criticism now is kind of you know, emerging in the field is now not just the original readings, but also why are these varied readings occurring? Yeah. It seems now they're really kind of tied in with now how the text is being received and read. I wonder if you see this would be as one of these, maybe not as large a contributing factor to some of this renewed interest. Uh, it seems to me when I go to these textual criticism sections of the SBL, a lot of them now are doing, well, why are readings emerging? What is this saying about exegesis in late antiquity? Right. I wonder if you may maybe comment on that. Should I repeat the question for the microphone? Sure. Okay. So the question was, trying to summarize it yeah, fairly, um, has the emergence of textual criticism um, in the 20th century uh, also informed, shaped the rise in the study of the history of exegesis? Yeah, kind of, yes. So, yes. Um, and there are a number of ways in which we see this. One is, as you mentioned, that um, variants can't simply be relegated to corruptions or errors. This is the old model for doing textual criticism, the old Lachmanian model where you try to construct your ideal text and beneath this ideal text are a series of corruptions. Now to be sure there are corruptions in manuscripts, but variant readings emerge which reflect different concerns and emphases. And we also see these variant readings not simply in biblical manuscripts, but in the writings of early Christian authors on scripture. So this is the second facet to the question. One of the reasons we need to edit early Christian commentaries on biblical texts or homilies or introductions is because they are often witnesses to other readings that we do not yet have access to. Um, as I was explaining to someone here today, I can't remember who, um, while I have been editing Adrian's introduction to the divine scriptures, I will go to the existing editions, the critical editions of the Septuagint, and I will look at Adrian's reading and I will look at the existing critical edition, and not only does Adrian print a different text from what's in the edition, I go down to the apparatus and I'm out of luck. There isn't even the variant reading in the apparatus. Our apparatuses are often not complete. And so to get a better sense of the transmission history of the Bible, we also need to study these early Christian commentaries on the Bible. And there are probably a few other ways um, in which early Christian biblical scholarship ties into modern developments, but those seem to me to be two obvious ways. Thank you for the question. Yes? Uh, given the uh, performative nature of uh, the Alexandrian tradition in terms of writing and uh, an explication, and the rhetorical training that uh, these scholars would have had. How do you, how do you, un how do you peel back layers into a biographical reading when uh, any given writer's product from his mind and hand is difficult to see by our biography? It's yeah. so much of it is performance. And so much of it is like declamation. It's yes. an imagined audience, an imagined situation uh, with no real historical reference. Right. How, how do you how do you get around that? And, and how do you 
That's a good question. So I, to elaborate a bit, um, the idea of getting back to an original origin, it's, um, it's almost a fool's errand um, because most of our biographical information about origin comes from later friends and foes. And the biographies conflict with one another. Um, perhaps to qualify or clarify, what I mean by a biographical approach is to attend to the way in which the person of the, interpre the, person of the interpreter is presented. That we can agree on, how this person is presented. Whether this is an ideal that is never instantiated in real life, well, we can leave that question open. But we can tell from the writings of early Christians that they have very clear notions about what ideal readers need to look like. And a lot of those facets have been suppressed in the scholarship, and I think in part because it is a modern instinct to try to reduce things to methods and pull out personal dimensions to inquiry. And so we search for the methods of origin. Let's talk about his allegory. Let's talk about his literal exegesis. And we stop from realizing that these are approaches to texts that are embedded in a deeper life, a richer life. And that's what I'm trying to correct, an overly mechanistic, modernistic portrayal of early Christian exegesis. Yes. Obviously, this is this could be a whole another lecture. But uh, you mentioned that one of the exciting kind of directions that uh, we're going in is looking at the effects of these exegetes on the Christian culture. And for you, with Origen, what do you feel like were some of the biggest ways that his um, his work, his uh, exegesis, impacted Christian culture. Uh, that's a good question. The question is, what was the social impact of Origen's exegesis? Now, scholars have answered that question differently. Some have approached it more cynically and said, this is about Origen achieving power for himself. Others have said, no, it's about what he said it was. What Origen does, if I can risk oversimplification, what Origen's exegetical project aspires to do is to transform the biblical text, which is sometimes recalcitrant and sometimes not, into a message that is edifying for his audience. Origen needs to pull out allegory when he's reading historical narratives. He doesn't want to preach to his people about stuff that's recorded in the Pentateuch. Who needs to know a travelogue of the Hebrews coming out of Egypt and moving to the Promised Land? Who needs to know that? Or does this is not our business? He wants to transform these narratives into something useful. Some texts prove very amenable, like Paul's letters, where Origen rarely, if ever, breaks out allegory. Another way to answer the question is to say, what happens after Origen dies? And what's very striking is that Origen, unlike the vast majority of early Christian intellectuals that we know, Origen had followers. He had followers, and they resided in the deserts of Egypt and the wilderness of Syria. They were monks. And it's pretty clear that Origen's work found a very receptive home among the monks and the wider ascetic movement that was emerging in the fourth century. And he was thought to undergird their ascetic program. And so something needs to be said, and some scholars have said this, about the ascetic impacts of Origen's work. Thank you very much.